Hello, welcome all. Today, we are going to talk about tips and tricks to tune your software for ARM. I'm sure you are either have already ported your software for ARM or are in process of getting your software ported for ARM. While porting is the one part, tuning is the second part and which is an ongoing process and pretty complex, I would say. So how about if we can get some initial starting tips and tricks that you can explore and start with to find out how you can easily tune your software for ARM. So we are going to explore that. I'm going to share some of the tips and tricks uh, based on my uh, experience uh, tuning MariaDB and MySQL for ARM. So let's get started. My name is Krunal Bauskar. I have been driving the DB on ARM initiative. That's quick intro about me. I have been working in Huawei as part of the DB on ARM initiative. Prior to that, I used to work with Percona, MySQL, Yahoo Labs, uh, Teradata and a lot more other companies. I do blog and I do speak at uh, most of the MySQL leading conferences. I have been working in MySQL space for quite some time and current latest uh, efforts has been to make MySQL and MariaDB and uh, all other uh, variants of databases optimal for ARM. So with that quick intro about me, let's talk about today's agenda. We will first see about the growing popularity of ARM, then why tune for ARM before we jump to our final topic of why tried and testing tip, tested tips to tune your software for ARM. And we'll end it up with some quick notes about future work. So we all know ARM market share is growing. In fact, in some of the industry, especially like mobile or IoT, it is market leader. And of course, these the scope of these industries also expanding. So continue to maintain the same market share itself is a big challenge. <clears throat> but in terms of other industries, network equipment, cloud, and vehicle infotainment, and infotainment, there is a significant growth that is expected in ARM market share in upcoming years. On cloud, when I say you know tip, uh, HPC applications, uh, that's where we see a huge potential for ARM processors. And in general, almost all softwares are now getting themselves ported and tuned for ARM. So what exactly has fueled this is easy availability of ARM resources. Now, whether it is in form of cloud like Huawei offer uh, instances using its Kunpeng 920, Amazon using Kribiotron, Oracle using Ampere, Apple uh, came up with a desktop version using M1 processors, Microsoft and Google um, also, uh, you know, if you believe the news uh, plan to come up with their own variant of ARM processors. Uh, in fact, this, this particular statement will clear out that how quickly ARM uh, processors are getting popular. In 2020 itself, 49% of the new instances that were booted on AWS were ARM instances. So you can imagine how many, how many people or users are interested in exploring ARM instances. And almost all major software now are either available on ARM or, you know, in process of getting available. In fact, on the database front, most of the popular open source databases are already available on ARM. So thanks to the price performance uh, that ARM has to offer. And of course, uh, the more cores that helps get more work done and in parallel. So the responsiveness and throughput in general uh, of software improves. So with all these good things happening, is your software ready for the next big thing? So market share is improving, cloud adoption is increasing, US, uh, users and developer uh, interest is growing and all. So, you know, is your software ready for this uh, to catch up with this particular next big thing? So let's understand with that note, why a uh, user need to tune for ARM? Because, you know, whenever we uh, spoke to in, so initially when I used to talk to some of the developers, then they would say, you know, well, my software actually uh, is works on little Indian architecture, then uh, ARM is little Indian, then my software should be easily uh, work on ARM. And I say that's true. Working on ARM is one part. So tuning for ARM is a second part. And that is where the, uh, you know, I would say the major challenge come. So getting a software to work on ARM um, should be, I would say, a first step. So majority of the software will just work out of box. Of course, uh, there is no binary compatibility, so you will have to recompile. But now compilers is available. So operating system have respective uh, you know, ports for ARM. So that should be an easy job. Third party libraries also have been now made available. So more or less the complete ecosystem is in a good shape. Uh, and most of the libraries uh, that you use regularly are available on ARM. 
and softwares uh, are using iterative approach so if you have a you, you know a software is big enough then they tend to port their core functionality first and they continue to expand uh, and add the additional functionality so i would say easy step is done uh, what is the next step which is more important is getting that software to tune and work optimally on arm and why is that important because arm is different if your software has been tuned for certain architecture when you want to make sure that it also works optimally on arm then you need to make sure understand that arm has different memory model the scalability challenges are different uh, you know in terms of instructions uh, set is different so low level instructions if your software is using that could be different atomics difference uh, affinity processor or timer control resistors all these aspects would be different so all this make it necessary to profile your software and tune it for arm so let's look at now the uh, some of the tips of how you can you know tune your software for arm so the first uh, is to reassess the memory model so let's understand this so we all know arm is a weaker memory model majority of the software that we have have been tuned for stronger memory model so if you try to run the same software directly on arm maybe you are not get using the optimal memory uh, barriers or basically memory order and getting the optimal performance most of the software these days are switching to use atomics or lock free programming so one couple of uh, important things uh, that are almost found in all softwares is there are there will be global counters and there will be some kind of synchronizations whether it's through spin loops or mutex something of that sort so especially with global counters if you use the default memory order then it will be the sequential consistent okay but um, being a global counter it doesn't it is not meant for synchronization so you could actually switch to use the uh, relaxed memory order and we'll see how it affects the performance but yes so that uh, is something which could help uh, you know with arm because arm being a weaker memory model same thing with uh, spin loop or anything which is meant to use for coordinations or of variables or state variables like things so again the default will be the sequential order and you can switch it to use acquire and release memory barriers so it is important that a proper or optimal memory barrier is used uh, when you are tuning your software for uh, different architectures so just to understand with an example if you look at here if you use a default memory order the operations per second is uh, lesser compared to when you switch over to use optimal memory order okay and uh, you can see uh, it is almost present for all scalability now what generally happens up is when users switch from a normal variable uh, with mutex to an atomic variable uh, there will be this kind of atomic increment which uh, if we will continue to use we may not change it we will just change the you know the declaration and uh, what would happen is that uh, this particular auto increment operator by default will enforce the default memory order which is sequentially consistent so what we really want is to change uh, and explicitly give the memory order such that uh, it use the optimal memory barrier same way if you talk about uh, let's say this is a simple spin loop uh, you know pseudo code kind of things and the default uh, as you could see will be always sequential order and the performance as you can see uh, with optimal memory barrier you are able to complete the workload uh, in a faster uh, in a lesser time and if you switch over to use the optimal memory barrier in this case it will be acquire and release barriers uh, it would surely help so again um, explicit memory barrier also helps clarify uh, the intention of what the programmer is trying to achieve so that is an, an secondary advantage but of course the performance advantage is always there so i think uh, this uh, aspect is one of the most important aspect i i would say 50% of the patches that uh, when initially got contributed to uh, mysql space when i say mysql as in like whether it, it includes mysql maria db and all uh, were mostly to do with optimal memory barriers and majority of these issues helped scale uh, mysql in a range of 3 to 5% so these were like you know really good impacting patches so with uh, that first thing taken care of the second thing would be the low level functions 
Now, uh, again, uh, some software use assembly level codes for some criti critical operations, uh, uh, um, you know, and if they are using it, then it is very important that, um, you know, by default, uh, if the architecture is, uh, not, uh, there is no special uh, loop for our architecture, then it will fall back to the default thing. So, but if you, if, uh, you know, if you actually are enabling it for ARM, then you should use the specific instruction that ARM is supporting. So, for example, for accessing virtual timers, memory barriers, uh, pause and yield okay so in x86 uh, there is a pause instruction but uh, arm uh, the corresponding thing is called yield so making sure that you add the uh, relevant code code for um, arm accessing the control registers uh, to find out their processor capabilities so the best uh, way to look at it is and the trick which i do is when i whenever you get a software just go ahead and scan for all instances uh, which have been you know for this particular string like x3664 and see if that relevant section has been only enabled for x3664 and the same section could be either enabled for um, you know uh, arm or you probably will have to rewrite uh, a section with a different uh, registers or different assembly code while uh, you know adding uh, a specific section for or specific instruction for arm is one part you will probably have to further study and tune it because you know the effect will be different just a simple thing pause uh, has a different uh, latency versus yield uh, on arm so you know just adding a relevant code may not help you scale the software and you may wonder that even after adding yield instruction why is my software not scaling so you may have to study maybe the latency which is expected from the said instruction is not coming up same way with timers on clock cycles or memory barriers or if there are logics which are specifically tied with the processor clock frequency uh, those kind of things I see this is a complex things, um, you know, in fact, the spin loop is one thing which we are still trying to tune. It has gone through so many variations in MySQL and MariaDB. We would not say it is perfect, uh, um, you know, the best optimal thing, but I think it is close to that. But it has taken us good time to reach there. And maybe there is still further scope of improvements on that front. Programming for more NUMA nodes. So uh, ARM, we all know, is a lot more coarse and in terms, it get more NUMA nodes. And with more NUMA nodes, it get its own set of challenges. So making sure that the cross NUMA moment is limited, NUMA latency, how do you handle it, NUMA thread affinity. So one small thing I want to clarify is traditionally when we used to hit some kind of contention, whether it was IO or CPU, then we used to look at it in two perspectives. Either you solve that contention by, you know, making sure the optimal use of the resources or you give more resources and the contention will get resolved. Your software will tend to scale. Now, while this particular thing still hold true, we call that as a scalability bottleneck. Let's look at these examples. Here, we actually are increasing the resources. So if you look at the uh, graph on the left hand side, here the operations per seconds are shown. When we are moving from one NUMA to two NUMA and from two NUMA to four NUMA, we are almost doubling uh, in each case. We are using the double the number of cores that have been given. Despite of that, the operations per seconds continue to consistently decrease. Let's look at this uh, right graph where we see the spin loop or the time uh, it takes for the workload to complete. So here the lesser is better. And as you could see here in this particular case, <coughs> Uh, when we moved from one NUMA to two NUMA, the time was same. But when we moved from two NUMA to four NUMA, there was sudden increase in the time. So that showed that the contention has suddenly increased when we moved from two NUMA to four NUMA. While the scalability uh, that we were trying on the client front was same. Despite of that, why there was an increase in contention when there was more resources that were given. And all of that could be attributed because there is what we are facing is a NUMA scalability issue. Now, this is not only true with some simple benchmark. So those were some micro benchmark. Now, this is a real world MySQL uh, graph. So we ran uh, a test with MySQL. And as you could see, when we moved from, uh, you know, 28 vCPU to 56 vCPU, the performance was slightly better. But when moment we moved from 56 vCPU to 112 vCPUs, like double the number of vCPUs, the performance drastically reduced almost by say 50%. And why is that? Because we moved from one two NUMA node to four NUMA nodes. Of course, we have crossed the uh, socket boundary too. But yes, I think these are the challenges that, uh, you know, what we uh, term them as a NUMA scalability issues. So how do you solve them? 
but before that uh, just a quick note uh, the typical understanding or even i used to have that before i started exploring it that one socket is equal to one numa node i think that is no more holding true uh, with kunpeng if you look at uh, one socket can actually have two numa nodes and in fact uh, this is uh, another processor from fujitsu where you could see one numa node uh, has four sorry one uh, socket has four numa nodes so that concept that one single socket means one numa node is no more true one uh, socket could be two or four numa nodes also so you need to think uh, from that perspective that how many numa nodes uh, a particular setup could have so how do you handle numa bottleneck now the first important thing is making sure that you evenly distribute your memory if you have 100 gb of memory make sure that uh, it is evenly distributed on all the numa nodes 25 25 25 uh um, localized numa processing as much as possible try to make sure that your processing threads are accessing the local numa memory now this is going to be difficult or you can also leave uh, even the os schedulers are improving to make sure that they are, uh, take care of this numa aspect but yes in some cases if you have very critical operation try to see if how much uh, you could do a localized operation uh, lesser cross numa moment if you your cpu you know uh, you can allow a thread to um, you know change the cores uh but maybe you can set its affinity such that it doesn't uh, leave the numa nodes so the cores from the same numa nodes will be uh, where, where it will get rescheduled something of that sort uh, you can try out for you can use uh, switch over to distributed counter locks global objects we'll see an example of that uh, even workload distribution if you have background threads make sure that they are evenly uh, working on all the numa nodes like if you have eight background threads two 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 on all not like all eight of them are working on single numa node so in general anything uh, all the principles of non shared architectures has to be applied so this is a, again a real life example uh, you know we we uh, face the numa bottleneck with maria db 10.6 as you could see when we moved from 1 to 2 numa node we saw linear scalability with point select or uh, this is a read only workload and um, when we moved from 2 to 4 there was a drop in the performance so to fix it we looked out and found out there is a global mutex so we moved to a table level mutex and uh, then we there was a global counter we moved to a distributed counter and the effect of it is we saw a linear increase uh, even with increasing numa nodes uh, for the performance and we are sure if you go beyond 4 to 8 and 16 numa node this linear uh, increase will continue that way so uh, also uh, there uh, when when you analyze the perf uh, some particular function may just report 1 to 2% uh, of the overhead but don't uh, ignore that because the weight graph could be quite different uh, with numa so uh, distributed counter so concept is like you know instead of having one single counter you distribute it into n number of different counters and each counter is local to that given numa nodes and every uh, core actually only updates that uh, its respective shred or the respective sub part of the counter and value of the total uh, value of the counter is actually the aggregate value of all the sub parts the challenge of course is uh, how does core actually knows uh, you know for getting we we'll, you'll have to have to get get a core id on the fly and the call for that is schedule get cpu unfortunately schedule get cpu on arm has a good latency because it is not implemented as vdso on uh, like it is done in x86 so also make sure that uh, the overhead of getting a core id is not more than uh, the cross numa latency the problem you are trying to solve same way with locks uh, you can uh, distribute the locks into stratified fashion so readers can uh, multiple readers can proceed every reader can uh, you know uh, pin its own shred of the lock uh, but if a, a writer wants to go then it will have to pin all the uh, shreds of the locks so that's what we call as distributed locks so all all these kind of approach helps you you know uh, uh, ease out the pressure on the global things and uh, scale better on numa things mind your cache line so you know we all understand arm as a bigger and wider cache line uh, most of the arm processors has 128 byte cache line i have also seen a mix where you know uh, l1 l2 may have 64 and l3 may have 128 so your software may be tuned for 64 or may have some hard coding or like padding or uh, you know the numbers of 64 byte cache line so make sure that uh, it is also changed to consider 128 bytes 
uh, especially global counter, global state variable, structures, locks, mutexes. So, of course, padding uh, increases the memory blot. So, we, we have this Alignas in C++. You can explore the same in other languages. I presume there will be something. And reorganizing the structure will help reduce this uh, thing. Sorry for that. Okay, branching. Um, this is another aspect I see. Um, you know, after the load and move, uh, branching is the most executed instruction. So you need to make sure that, and the branching could be implemented differently by every processor. In fact, including in ARM, every variant may implement uh, branching differently. So from that perspective too, it is important that we. Uh, you know, so specify exactly of how or what is expected. So it is optimized in the same way on all the platforms. So this is a simple example where if you don't specify, um, you know, any kind of uh, hints to the compiler uh, versus if you specify hint to compiler, you will get better performance. So it's always better because then it will be optimized in the same way for every uh, processor where your wherever your software is going to run. 64 bit processing. So ARM is 64. Most of the ARM V8 processors are 64 bit processor. So there are loops inside uh, softwares which are tuned to take advantage of this 64 uh, bits things like this is an example from MySQL and it is enabled uh, for x86 64. So we have to make sure that it is also enabled for ARM based processors. Hardware level functions. So a lot of hardware level functions exist uh, like checksums and, you know, um, cryptographic related, timer related, uh, prefetching of the data and all. So these, uh, you know, they, of course, they help scale, right? So we see that in checksum, uh, the software checksum uh, and hardware checksum, you can see that hardware checksum is giving 28x times better performance. So well, when something of that sort is there, uh, try to make sure that, uh, you know, you look at, you go and look at those aspects and add the relevant uh, sections of uh, ARM instructions or the hardware instructions. So different variants of instruction memory barrier, prefetch of data, swapping of the data and all. Additional functionalities. So ARM uh, do support large system extensions, uh, mainly meant for atomics. Uh, so that that actually let's understand this one example. If you don't have uh, the LSE enabled, then you will get a loop uh, for servicing a simple atomics. Uh, but if you enable at a LSE, then it will be converted from a loop to a single statement. Um, and now, uh, since no, not all, every all ARM V8 processors uh, do support uh, at LSE, so you know, uh, a compiler can emit a statement such that you know, depending on the compiler, uh, sorry, processor capability, it can either execute a single line statement or the loop. So this is good, but you know, not that always this particular approach helps. So we have shown a graph where it seems that, uh, you know, LSE approach is good, but uh, at least in the simple example we did, it is not that LSE is always helping. So whenever you evaluate things, uh, try to make sure that you try it out and see whether the, this approach is helping your software in all uh, the use cases and then enable it. SIMD Neon, I think this is one of the most neglected thing. Uh, you know, you can use it for parallelizing uh, the things, uh, especially uh, whenever there is, um, you know, whenever, so in, in from a database world, if there are a lot of times when we have to map a character set from X uh, character set to Y. So that's like a more like a parallel vectorized operation. So that's um, a best way to explore or for that matter in PG SQL, uh, they explored that, okay, uh, when, two numeric uh, data types were supposed to be multiplied uh, the for loop they rewrote it such uh, using the simd instruction and they got a better performance so all these uh, small small uh, aspect that uh, you have to or for that matter uh, page compressions uh, that needs to be explored sometime you know if your gcc most of the softwares um, uh, so if your gcc is operating with o3 uh, by default uh, gcc will take care of it most of the software don't operate with o3 they operate with o2 uh, for for easy in debugging uh, debugability so that sense also it is important so future work uh, so a lot of the, so we just saw some of the tips and tricks uh, there are a lot of future works that could be done uh, exploring uh, more new my aspect uh, inter socket communication links uh, improving uh, the scalability vector extensions usage so all all such things and of course the uh, community can continue to add to it
with that we come to an end to a presentation uh, you can uh, you know we'll throw open the session for question and answers now uh, but of course you can follow me uh, that's my mail blog uh, there are slack channels and uh, that's my tweet handle thank you so much and uh, we'll now throw open the session for question and answers